surely one of the best inside views of the Reformation would have to be, have been that possessed by the much married Vibrandus Rosenblatt. For in her matrimonial migrations, she would be the wife, uh, successively, of three of the principal leaders of the Reformation. Vibrandus was born in Basel in 1504. Ironically, she was named after the remains of a saint which uh, lay in the altar of the Basel Cathedral, from which very pulpit one of her future husbands would denounce such relic venerating practices. Not quite 20, she was married to the esteemed Basel humanist Ludwig Keller. Among the several things that uh, Keller must have liked in his new wife was her name, for it is what he decided to call their daughter that uh, she bore him. This first marriage proved short, for her husband died only two years later, leaving her, Vibrandus, a widow with child at 22. Her consequent availability proved a happy circumstance for a certain Basel bachelor. It is unlikely she would not have noticed him in the city, for his post as principal preacher would have rendered him as prominent as his pendulous promontory of a nose. You have seen his picture. Do you want to hold that up so people can see that little picture there? Like there, that? Upside down, or back to front so they can see it. Well, not. Perfect, there he goes. There is, look at that nose, that promontory of a nose. Watch the noses, bro. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Gaunt, stooped, and ill-nourished, he appeared to some a mere sack of bones. And friends of the gospel feared they might lose him to the cause, unless there would be someone to feed him square meals and tell him when to blow out his candle for the night. Concern was heightened now that his mother, who had tried to perform such a role, had died, leaving him to fend for himself and take care also of his aging father, who was there with him. His old friend, uh, Wolfgang Capito, wrote to prompt him, marriage is an honorable, is honorable, and especially for a Christian pastor. If a suitable person is pointed out to you, I think you should not decline. To have a mate of like zeal will be to the glory of the Lord. Then, uh, wondering if the old bachelor might be inadequately discriminating, he added, but there is no greater cross than to be married to a daughter of Belial. <laughs> Seeking to allay his friend's fears, Ocolampadius, for that was the second, uh, the bachelor on the market here, replied, don't worry about my marrying. Either I will find a Christian sister like Monica, Augustine's That's mother, right. Monica, and, and uh, emblematic of virtue. Okay. Either I will find a Christian sister like Monica, or I will remain unmarried. Such a woman is a rare bird, but perhaps one can be netted. <laughs> well, he found in Vibrandus a Monica-like sister and netted her March 15, 1528. She was 24. He was 45. Some, uh, focusing on the physical, I suppose, thought them ill-matched. Uh, one commented, Boniface uh, Aberbach, uh, rather uncharitably commented, quote, a decrepit old man with trembling head and body, so emaciated and wasted that you might well call him a living corpse has married an elegant and blooming girl of 20, more or less. Erasmus teased that it was a rather indulgent thing to do for Lent, <laughs> scarcely castigating the flesh to take a wife of 20 years old. But Ocolampadius had not netted her for form or face, but for her faith. He wrote to Farel, the Lord has given me a sister and wife. She is well versed in the knowledge of Christ, and she has several years of experience in bearing the cross. That was the currency of weight for them. And before long, she was also bearing a son, Eusebius, born on Christmas Eve, 1528. It would be an eventful year for the Ocolampadiuses, 
for the arrival of their first coincided with the dramatic crescendo of the Reformation surge in the city that I've just described, the storming of the cathedral and the bonfire of the vanities. Happily, their new baby was not colic. Eusebius, reported Oculumpadius, is a gentle and a quiet child, unless hungry, thirsty, or in need of a change. I didn't know there was ever any other condition. <laughs> hungry, thirsty, or in need of a change, as I recall. But uh, the father also noted, he is very subject to colds and coughing. I fear he will not live long. Uh, they would lose him at 13 years old. He would only live to 13. Quite old, actually, for most. Other children came, two daughters whom they named Alethea, tr Alethea tr Truth, and Irena, Peace. Uh, Vibrandus's ever burgeoning home was constantly the site of hospitality, offered to many of the leaders of the Reformation. Uh, Zwingli visited them. Uh, Wolfgang Capito sampled her cooking, little knowing that in the future he would enjoy a good bit more of it. Uh, even Servetus dropped by. Soon, Vibrandus was exchanging letters with Anna Zwingli, Agnes Capito, Elizabeth Busser. When in 1531, Zwingli died on the field of Capel, uh, Ucalampadius was invited to Zurich to replace the fallen leader. He declared, probably sensing that for him the sands were low, he declined, and indeed in a month he followed his friend Zwingli to the grave. So Vibrandus was thus at 26 years old, for the second time a widow, now with four small children. That very month in Strasbourg, Capito's wife, Agnes, was taken. And Booser, who was also active in finding, was, he was all, Booser was always active in finding wives for his colleagues, cast his eye about for a new wife for the widower, fearing that given Capito's inclination to depression, and the bitter, that the bitter loss of his wife would take a devastating toll on him. Well, Booser didn't have to look very far. He revealed to a friend his matchmaking ambition. My choice for Capito is the <laughs> widow of Oculumpadius. And it seems that Capito already had Vibrandus on his mind, feeling for his loss. He, Capito, writes me, that he has been very touched by the sight of the widow Vibrandus and the poor orphaned children. So Booser proposed to Capito that a trip would do him good and suggested the beautiful city of Basel. <laughs> uh, why, you could drop in on the vi widow Vibrandus while you're there and offer her some comfort. Well, Capito thought the trip a fine idea, and when he arrived in Basel, he offered Vibrandus a little more than comfort. He offered her his hand in marriage. They were married on August 11th, 1532, much to the glee and satisfaction of Booser. Well, of course, when Capito returned with his new wife, the family included uh, the four children of Vibrandus and Vibrandus's mother. So we've got Vibrandus has one, there, there was Vibrandus, little Vibrandus from the marriage with Keller, then there's Eusebius, Irena, and Aletheia from the Columpadia, so four and her mother. Uh, Vibrandus slotted into the new routine quite easily, as uh, her new husband's life scarcely differed from her late husband, uh, both being pastor professors. The daily round she took in stride, her energies were strained, however, by keeping the cradle full. Uh, to Capito, she bore five more children. Uh, Agnes, uh, uh, which they named after Capito's late wife, Agnes, so their first child they called Agnes, then Dorothea, then Johann Simon, then Wolfgang Christoph, and another Irena. So they had two responding to Irena in their family, two uh, girls. Her good friend in Strasbourg, Elizabeth Booser, the wife of Martin Booser, had borne her husband, Martin, 13 children. 13 children. Those after church picnics must have been pretty lively <laughs> when both the Capitos and the Boosers showed up in full strength. But uh, 
there was a, her uh, a winnowing factor. Uh, in 1541, the Black Death struck Strasbourg, claiming, according to the chronicler in the, in the day, and the town clerk, 3,200, 3,200 uh, lives across the city. At the Booser household, remember 13 children? Only one of 13 survived the deadly scourge. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, he was a mentally and physically handicapped boy, and he made it through. Uh, so they lost 12 of the 13 children. And Elizabeth herself, the mother, was taken. Uh, she might have saved her life had she left the city at the outbreak of the epidemic. A lot of people would try to flee. You would try to flee a confined space and head to colder parts. Uh, but uh, she did not. Her husband would not leave his flock, and she would not leave her husband. In the Capito household, the plague took Eusebius, the son of Vibrandus by Oclumpadius, Dorotea, Wolfgang Christoph, uh, so two of her children by Capito, and Capito himself, her husband. So, Vibrandus was again widowed, uh, with four surviving children and an aged mother. She's about 47 years old at the time. As, <laughs> as Elizabeth Booser lay stricken, Catherine Sell, you remember her, that extraordinary woman, Catherine Sell came to bring the news of Wolfgang Capito's death. Elizabeth, aware that for her the bell would shortly toll, asked her husband, Martin Booser, to take the place of his colleague Capito by taking the widowed Vibrandus to be his wife. If you can keep these things straight. Uh, it's... Um, Booser answered only by tears. Uh, yet Elizabeth insisted and sent for Vibrandus, who had <coughs> been only just widowed the night before, okay, uh, hesitated to be seen in public by day. You had to go through an official mourning period. So she came under cover of night and received Elizabeth's dying plea to care for her husband uh, as his wife when she died. So Elizabeth is actually on her deathbed, joins the hands of Vibrandus and her husband Martin Boother and says, this is my last wish. Um, well, uh, the wish of Elizabeth was fulfilled. In April of 1542, Vibrandus took her place uh, beside Martin Booser as his wife, he being her fourth husband. Vibrandus proved a good wife to Booser. He wrote to a friend, I only hope I can be as kind to my new wife as she is to me. But oh, the pang. For the one I have lost. Well, the new Booser household, though uh, sorely reduced by the plague, was still not small. And Vibrandus certainly had her hands full. Uh, Booser had a surviving son, uh, the handicapped Nathaniel. Uh, Vibrandus brought uh, her mother and four children into it, uh, making for a family of eight. Uh, and then along with Vibrandus' mother was also Martin Booser's aged father and his father's second wife, who was aged. <laughs> so, uh, and soon, more children arrived uh, to the new couple, for she bore Booser a son and a daughter. Uh, so uh, though they were now at double digits of children, they still decided to augment their brood, uh, still further, through adoption. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of parentless children after the plague, so they adopted uh, uh, a niece of Vibrandus was adopted, uh, uh, Margareta. Well, it must have felt like a Sunday school when they all gathered around the table. Before and after every meal, uh, Booser would read a chapter from the scripture, followed by a comment. Said one lodger, I always went away from his table more instructed, with doubts dissolved and confusions clarified. Well, I find myself wondering 
how Booser was able to get so much done in his life in the midst of this nursery of little needy ones. Uh, there is indication that he managed to do so by staying up the balance of the night. An Italian immigrant who stayed in the Booser household for 17 days, recalled of Booser, uh, his, uh, he devotes his nights to, the, to study and prayer. And I have never awakened without finding him still up. That was Vermilion. But even if we imagine Booser helping with the burgeoning brood, uh, went around during the day, there were plenty of seasons when he was not, and Vibrandus had to hold the fort without him. On one occasion, Booser was away on a trip for an entire year. She did, of course, have her mother to help out, but not infrequently. Uh, she, being well advanced in years, required more help than she was able to offer. In February 1548, a friend wrote, Booser is away on some business, who knows what, I do not know where. His wife is having to take care of her sick mother and two sick children. Another long absence came when Booser was called away to England, you remember, to fill the Regis professorship at Cambridge. He went abroad, or he, he went ahead, and hoped that Vibrandus and the family would join him uh, once he was settled into a home over there. She must have been quite secure in their relationship, uh, along with the possession of a robust sense of humor, for her old friend who was with Booser in England wrote teasingly, you'd better come and care for Booser quickly, else he might marry someone else. The Duchess of Suffolk would have him in a heartbeat. She is a widow too. Well, whatever were the hopes of the Duchess of Suffolk, it is clear what Booser wanted. He wrote expressing the hope that she might join him soon. How I'd love to have you here, but we are in the Lord's hands. Uh, while it is obvious that it was Vibrandus he missed, it's also evident that he missed all the practical ways she took care of him, for he was not managing to do very well on his own. At the end of his plea for her to join him, he adds, if you cannot come, I wonder if a trusty brother and his wife might come to cook for me uh, and look after the house. You know what, a con what kind of housekeeper I am. If I could have that hope, I could the better spare you until the times improve, but I am in the Lord's hands. His final PS was a request for certain books she might obtain for him. Thus, Vibrandus also acted as his book agent on the European continent while he was in England. It was not easy for Booser to be apart from his family. Truly, it is no light cross to give up. One's own household, he wrote. But before too long, she was restored to her husband's side, making the trip to England with an advanced contingent of the family. Surveying the scene, she decided to return for the rest, leaving Agnes Capito, daughter by her third husband, to look after her fourth husband. She got back to Strasbourg to find that the Romanists were trying to confiscate their property. Uh, Vibrandus was summoned to appear in court. We have a hint as to her plucky nature from this incident. It seems one of her local friends, Sol, was concerned that Vibrandus would give the magistrates a piece of her mind over their injustice. Uh, she wrote to Booser, Sol confided to me his fear that if I appeared in court, I would say something hot, and indeed I might well have done so. Instead of appearing in court, she, uh, she had the fine idea of relaxing through a visit to a spa. It seems that such hot spring spas were a favorite retreat for the fast-paced boosters, for Martin fantasized over his German thermal baths more than once during his cold, wet winters in Cambridge. Uh, I shiver just to think of them. Uh, in fact, a lot of Vibrandus' letters are written, you know, yours Vibrandus, keep your head up, Martin, yours Vibrandus, from the spa. <laughs> <laughs> Refreshed from her spa tune-up, Vibrandus packed up the rest of the family, grandma and all, and made the journey back to England. But scarcely had she finally arrived when Booser fell ill. Vibrandus, in caring for her husband, grew so exhausted herself 
She remembered the teasing about an admiring Duchess of Suffolk and actually asked the Duchess if she would be willing to help relieve her of her incessant nursing through the final stages of Booster's illness. Uh, the Duchess cordially obliged and by taking part of the load probably saved Vibrandus from a breakdown. With her husband gone, there was no reason for her to remain a foreigner in England, so she worked on getting the whole family back to Strasbourg. But alas, money was lacking, and she had to appeal to Cranmer, Archbishop Cranmer's kindness, to help get them all home. This he did gladly. Uh, she did leave the Archbishop, Cranmer, uh, Booster's books, uh, what was left of them, uh, Cramner complained that the Duchess got the best ones. But the Brondus managed to get all the family home, grandma and all. But most were now gone that she had once known and loved. So she moved on from Strasbourg to the city of her birth. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, from Strasbourg to Basel, the city of her birth. One wonders if a prospective fifth husband was waiting in the wings. Well, in any case, her matrimonial migrations had finally come to an end. In 1564, a terrible plague carried off 7,000 in the city. Vibrandus was among them. She was laid to rest beside her second husband, Ucolampadius, in the cloister walk of the cathedral. And now, I suppose, the pressing question is that of the Sadducees. <laughs> <laughs> Whose wife shall she be in the judgment? <laughs> she was cast by the hand of providence into demanding callings. She answered that call with a life of courage, character, and commitment. Firmly established on the Rock of Ages, she was able to stand amidst the tumults of life and weather the fierce storms of the age. And upon that great rock, she was able herself to be a little rock for the many God had given her to love and care for. Neither could they have been what they were without her. And if history stints her praise, its author does not. He sees all and he knows all. If history sees her behind her famous husbands, no doubt God sees her beside.